All right, here we go. This is nitrogen metabolism looking at amino acid catabolism. I just slid that over and I was meaning to highlight it. So we're going to break down the amino acid all the way into its nitrogen components and into its carbon components, spending most of our time looking on how to get the nitrogen off of the amino acid through the urea cycle, make urea, and get it out of the body. We're going to spend quite a bit of time drawing today, and you're going to need to be able to draw all the intermediates of the urea cycle. And there's not that many of them, but they're pretty unique. Determine where each atom from urea originates, like what molecule is the source of each atom. Calculate the energetic cost of the urea cycle. State the cellular locations of the intermediates. Explain the metabolic regulation. And then explain the difference between glucogenic and ketogenic amino acids. So some things to consider is that in mammals, excess nitrogen has to get out of the body. It's very, very toxic. And the way that nitrogen leaves the body for mammals um, is this molecule called urea. And this is what it looks like. It has two nitrogens, one in each side of the carbonyl. And once urea is made, it gets excreted out. So some things to consider, like I said in the some of the learning objectives, is like where do each... Like, what's the source of each of the atoms? What's the energy cost? And what are the cellular locations of the intermediates? We're going to draw. This is going to take quite a bit of time. And I'm just going to slide this out of the way. My piece of paper is the hot dog way, the long way. And just because of the way that, thing, the way that I draw... In this program, I'm going to have to do the zoom, zoom, zoom thing, but I did get everything to fit on one sheet of blank computer paper, the long hot dog way. And we're going to do, I'm going to do this in a similar way that we've done all the drawings that come before this. So we're going to have the cytoplasmic membrane, and then we're going to have two membranes for the mitochondria, and we're going to be moving in and out of the mitochondria quite frequently. Now, if you remember from last time, I know where we ended off was the proteins, whether they were dietary proteins or whether they were non-dietary proteins, all got broken down into amino acids. So what we have arriving at the liver... are single amino acids, AA for amino acid. Now, if it's a non-dietary protein, the amino acid is just going to be on the inside. But this is going to be the liver cytosol. And then we have the mitochondrial matrix here. And the two membranes of the mitochondrial matrix we have the inner membrane, which I abbreviate as IM, and the outer membrane, which is OM. And then all the way over here on the left is, I'll put CM for the cytoplasmic membrane, the entrance to the cell. Almost all of the amino acids are broken down in the liver. So we're going to spend all of our time in the liver, and then at the very end we'll talk a little bit about amino acids um, that are broken down elsewhere. So the first thing that happens, I'm going to stay in black for my carbon intermediates. Let me get that to go away. The first thing that happens is the amino acids that are arriving are going to transport in. And I'm going to go ahead and start zooming now so that I can draw. It's easier for me to um, draw zoomed in just because, just because I like this. The pen that I use to draw with, so I'm just going to draw. And I'm going to draw almost every single intermediate because, again, I want you to be able to trace the path, like follow the nitrogen all the way, follow the nitrogen, the carbon, and the oxygen all the way to urea. So the amino acids, and we're just going to do any amino acid, like could be alanine, could be 
cysteine, tryptophan, tyrosine, just pick an amino acid. And all the amino acids have the general structure NCC H plus, and then whatever's coming off of that alpha carbon R is the different amino acid. And the first thing that happens, and this happens in this is in the cytosol, is there's an enzyme called a transaminase. And they're pretty specific for the different amino acids that they catalyze, but the reaction in general is the same. This is called a transaminase. We'll take an amino acid and turn it into this molecule called an alpha keto acid. And we'll talk about where the alpha keto acids go in a minute. But in order to do this, basically it takes the nitrogen off the amino acid and it's got to move it somewhere else. And this is pretty specific for moving the nitrogen onto glutamic acid, which means um, how that's done is another alpha keto acid is going to come in and it's a specific alpha keto acid. So I'm going to draw it. Hey, little guy, I'm missing a carbon. Choop. There we go. Okay, yeah, two carbons in there. This is called alpha ketoglutarate. It's an intermediate in the TCA cycle. Alpha ketoglutarate is an alpha keto acid. And in a transaminase reaction, it will take the nitrogen off the amino acid to create glutamic acid. Okay, so that's the first step in breaking down all the amino acids is that that nitrogen is passed onto glutamic acid. So a transaminase, it looks like, if you were just to name the substrates and products, it looks like they're the same. Like an amino acid and an alpha keto acid go in, and what comes out is an amino acid and an alpha keto acid. Anyways, so glutamic acid is the amino acid that gets generated or the nitrogen gets passed to glutamic acid and that really kicks off the movement of the nitrogens into the urea cycle because glutamic acid will move into I'm just going to move the glutamic acid in over here Zoop. glutamic acid moves into the mitochondrial matrix and then that nitrogen gets ripped off of the glutamic acid. That sounded a little bit more dramatic than I meant it to. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called glutamic acid dehydrogenase. So I'm going to do GLUDH. And the products of this are alpha ketoglutarate and ammonium. So the nitrogen's just been popped off. And because it's a dehydrogenase, that means that we're going to get out, uh, that, that means it's a, a redox reaction. And this enzyme is really interesting in that it can use either NADH or NADPH, in this case NAD, um, NAD plus NADP plus, and create one of the two, NAD. I'll put in parentheses, pH. And in the matrix, the reason that this reaction, which is reversible, ends up favoring the products is because very quickly when the, the ammonium is made, this NH4, it gets whoosh, scooped up by the next reaction because this is super toxic. Having free ammonium 
in the cell, super, 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 super toxic. So the way that this proceeds forward to keep making the NH4 is at the very next step, which is the beginning of the urea cycle, um, scoops that um, NH4 up and incorporates it into a new molecule. So now the very next step where we're going to use the next enzyme is the beginning of the urea cycle. So right now we've started with amino acid, we've moved the nitrogen into the matrix, and we've stripped it off of glutamic acid. So the NH4 is free in the mitochondrial matrix, and it's going to be converted very, very quickly into this molecule called carbamoyl phosphatase, or carbamoyl phosphate. And I'm going to draw it. There's the nitrogen. And we're going to need some HCO3, some bicarb to enter. And that's going to give us that piece. And carbamoyl phosphate also has a phosphate on it. And the source of that phosphate is ATP. Now, in order to get this reaction to go, it actually takes two ATPs. So it needs an energy source. And you'll get two ADPs out. One phosphate gets transferred onto this carbamoyl phosphate, and the other one just leaves as free phosphate. That should give us conservation of all of our ATPs. Actually, I gotta, I gotta rotate here. All right, so like I said, this is called carb amoyl phosphate. I'll just do the P with the circle on it. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction, I'm gonna slide this over. Maybe I'll do in red carb amoyl phosphate synthetase. And this enzyme catalyzes the rate limiting step of the urea cycle. So I'm just going to put a red arrow. So this is the slowest step of the urea cycle, which means this enzyme is going to be also the enzyme that's going to be regulated. And it's going to be the only enzyme that I include throughout the urea cycle. But just remember, every single arrow is a new enzyme in the urea cycle. All right, so now we've moved the nitrogen, we've incorporated it in carbamoyl phosphate, and now we need to start the, the actual circle, the path of the urea cycle to create the urea and get it excreted out. Now, as I'm going to draw here, I'm just going to give you a little, um, little history lesson. Turns out Krebs, who discovered the TCA cycle, which a, a lot of people call the Krebs cycle, also discovered the urea cycle. But he discovered it before he discovered the urea cycle or before he discovered the TCA cycle. Anyways, so I don't call either of them the Krebs cycle because if you want to call them by who they're, who, who figured them out, they'd really both be called the Krebs cycle. And really the urea cycle should be the Krebs cycle because it was the first one discovered by Krebs and then the TCA cycle was discovered. Anyways, they, they are connected though, the urea cycle and the TCA cycle, both discovered by Krebs. Food for thought. All right, here we go. Also both look like circles on this piece of paper. So here we go. We're going to do, I'm going to do ornithine. Is going to combine with carbamoyl phosphate and give us a molecule called citrulline. And in the process, we're going to pop a phosphate off. Pop that phosphate off. Ornithine's really interesting because it's an amino acid. It's not one of the 20 essential amino acids, but it's an amino acid. So it has the typical amino acid structure. I'll just see OO minus. And it's essentially arginine with the guanidinium clipped off. One, two, three to NH3+, plus, which means it looks a lot like lysine, but it is one carbon shorter, one methylene shorter. So ornithine is going to combine with carbamoyl phosphate to give us citrulline. And I'm just going to move the, the backbone over here, the backbone of ornithine, here, 
and now going right to left is going to be the side chain coming one, two, three to the nitrogen. And we're going to add the carbon oil phosphate, so the carbonyl carbon to the NH2. There we go. Citrulline moves out. And the reason I've drawn these near their membranes is because they're going to move in and out of the cytosol. So citrulline is going to move out into the cytosol. So citrulline will be located in terms of locations both in the cytosol. You'll find some citrulline molecules in the cytosol and you'll find some of them in the mitochondrial matrix. The same with ornithine. Zoom, 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 zoom. I'm going to zoom here, citrulline. I'm not going to redraw it on this side. You already have it. And then citrulline, oops, excuse me, is going to combine with some ATP to make this really interesting intermediate. So ATP is going to go in pyrophosphate is coming out to make this really interesting intermediate where basically it's citrulline plus an AMP and it's called citrulil-AMP intermediate. I'm not going to draw it. Essentially the AMP makes it so that there's a really good leaving group on the citrulline. So that in the next step, when aspartic acid is added in, aspartic acid, ASP, let me draw aspartic acid for you. As a reminder, also an amino acid. The aspartic acid will pop the AMP off. So the AMP is just a really good leaving group. And we'll be left with this really interesting molecule called argininosuccinate. Argininosuccinate. Okay, so I'm going to do the, I'm going to draw right to left on this. So I'm going to start over here um, with my, what was ornithine. And see, see, there's the ornithine backbone. H3 plus with my three carbons to a nitrogen three. to another carbon. Now this was the carbonyl, so the C to the double bond O, but because of this intermediate, it's changed to a C double bond N H2 plus. We're starting to make that guanidinium group. And then the rest of it is the aspartic acid. Nitrogen from the backbone of the aspartic acid. There's the alpha carbon. There's that guy. And then here is the side chain of the aspartic acid. So that's argininosuccinate. We're getting there. Argininosuccinate will become arginine by breaking off this end of the carbon end of what was aspartic acid. That's fumarate. I'll keep it in red. Fumarate. COO minus C. Hopefully you're seeing some connections here, some more connections to the TCA cycle. Whoops, I got too many I got too many bonds on that guy. Two, three, four. Two, three, four. H. It's a beautifully symmetrical molecule, fumarate. All right, that makes arginine. Hopefully you remember what arginine looks like. I'm gonna keep. I'm going to keep it going the same way that I was going, where I'm starting to the right and drawing to the left. N, C, C. Let 
one, two, three, to the nitrogen, to the carbon, oops, I'm sorry, to the, um, <laughs> I'm trying to make the guana, guanidinium functional group, And the last step here is going to make, is going to get us back to ornithine. So I'm just going to put an orn there. And we're going to use water as our nucleophile and make urea. Cool, huh? So this urea essentially attacks here, I forgot a hydrogen there, attacks at that carbon, electrons move around, and you break the bond um, from the guanidinium to that nitrogen, and what comes off is the urea, and then you get ornithine, and ornithine doop, travels back in to the mitochondrial matrix. All right, so all of the atoms, we wanted to figure out where all the atoms came from. So we're gonna backtrack into this a little bit. I'm gonna use some different colors. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use four different colors to figure out, for us to figure out where everybody's coming from. Let's start with pink. Whoa. All right, so let's look at this nitrogen. is coming from, I'll box this nitrogen, which is this nitrogen, which came from aspartic acid. So one of the nitrogens in urea always comes from aspartic acid or ASP or aspartate. I'm gonna do lime green for the other nitrogen. So if I follow this nitrogen, which is that nitrogen, which is this nitrogen, all the way back over here to citrulline, it's the end there, and that one came from carbamoyl phosphate, which came from ammonium, which came from glutamic acid, which came from See that glutamic acid there, which came from the original amino acid. So again, the whole goal here for the amino acids is to get them broken all the way down into their pieces. And one of them is to get the nitrogen off, remove it, put it on urea, and get rid of urea. I should probably have, i got to move urea out of the cell. So one of the nitrogens on urea always comes from whatever the original amino acid was that you were trying to break down. All right, let's look at the other, there's only two atoms left, the carbon and the oxygen. I'll do the, I'm gonna just do the oxygen in yellow. The oxygen comes from water. <laughs> Easy, done. And then if we look at the carbon, figure out where the carbon comes from. Well, it's this carbon here which is this carbon in arginosuccinate, which is this carbon in citrulline, which is this carbon in carbamoyl phosphate, which comes from the bicarbonate that is in the mitochondrial matrix. So that accounts for all of the atoms in urea. And like I said, once the urea gets made, it gets moved out, excuse me, Gotta go, bye-bye. The urea will be moved out and then it gets excreted. Bye. Bye-bye urea, bye-bye nitrogens. Other organisms get rid of their nitrogens in different ways, but we're just gonna focus on uh, mammals and in particular humans. All right, so that is the urea cycle and the movement of all the nitrogens off of all the possible amino acids. Again, the rate limiting step is catalyzed by carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. 
and the regulation of carbamoyl phosphate synthetase essentially impacts whether the urea cycle is upregulated or downregulated because, like I said, it's the rate limiting enzyme and it's the one um, that kind of starts the whole cycle. And the way that it's regulated is through allosteric activation. And it's allosterically activated. Going back to black here. It's allosterically activated, like feed forward activated by this molecule called acetyl glutamate, GLU, where an acetyl CoA is added on here. A CoA is going to come off. So what's made in this reaction is acetyl GLU, and that will allosterically activate, so sometimes we represent that as a triangle with a circle around it, allosterically activates carbamoyl synthetase, which is sort of like a feed-forward activation. It's telling carbamoyl phosphate synthetase that there's a lot of glutamic acid in the mitochondrial matrix, and what that indicates is there's amino acids that need to be broken down into their carbon bits and also into their nitrogen bits. So it's like, all right, time to ramp up um, in your regulation. So acetyl GLU or acetyl glutamate will feed forward allosterically activate carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. All right, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna probably erase that just so I've got a little bit more room. We're getting pretty close to the end. But what we haven't talked about, I don't know if you've noticed, is um, what do you do with all the carbons on the amino acid? Hey, buddy, I gotta move. Should I click on that one? I gotta move this. I need to erase. What do we do with the carbons? Well, you actually already know. We've met them. We've met all the pathways before. All right, so we have this alpha keto acid that's coming off of all of the different amino acids. And where this alpha keto acid goes dictates like what type of amino acid. How do I say this? Like metabolically, whether the amino acid is considered glucogenic or whether it's considered ketogenic. And these alpha keto acids, which can be things like alpha ketoglutarate or pyruvate or oxaloacetate, ultimately end up somewhere either making OAA or making acetyl CoA. So if you remember, I'm going to have to zoom in on the mitochondrial matrix here for this guy. If you remember, we've got um, pyruvate that can go to acetyl-CoA. And then from acetyl-CoA, if the TCA cycle is running, you get OAA to citrate. I'm going to leave the coenzymes out for now. Isocitrate. alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA. I'm just going to put S-CoA to succinate to fumarate. to malate to OAA. And this OAA can be um, siphoned off I'm just going to do this this OAA can be siphoned off moved out into the cytosol and run through gluconeogenesis to make glucose just going to this is going to help you understand what the difference between glucogenic is and ketogenic acetyl-CoA if it doesn't enter into the citric acid cycle 
can go to make ketone bodies. Okay. So if the amino acid is glucogenic, I'll just make it cross. If the keto alpha keto acid is glucogenic, it's going to enter in somewhere into the TCA cycle that leads to let's it can be any of these guys. If it and if it's alpha keto or glutarate, succinate, I think some of them are S-CoA, malate and malate fumarate or OAA. Basically, if the road leads to OAA, then it's going to be glucogenic, meaning it, it will lead to making glucose. If instead the alpha keto acid ends up as acetyl-CoA, it's going to be considered ketogenic. And some amino acids can be both glucogenic or ketogenic. So ketogenic means it's going to make ketone bodies and those ketone bodies can go to the brain and get turned back into acetyl-CoA and go through the TCA cycle. And then again, the glucogenic ones means that it makes glucose. Oh, I forgot to talk about the energetic cost of the urea cycle. <laughs> energetic cost of the urea cycle per nitrogen. Per nitrogen. Let's use yellow. Um, it costs 2 ATP here and 1 ATP there. So we'll do, click on this and click on this. Per nitrogen, it costs 3 ATP. This is not including... Um, Oh, I'm gonna put a negative three. The cost is the cost is three ATP. You're not getting ATP out of this. I'm not including uh, what you're gonna get out ATP wise from breaking down the alpha keto acid, but just moving the nitrogen off of the amino acid and getting it through the urea cycle. We're well, starting this will just be urea cycle. Um, it costs three ATP. Now, if you're gonna go all the way back to the original amino acid, you're actually going to get a little bit out here, so you'll get a positive um, NADH or NADPH, but this is the urea cycle. The This uh, glutamic acid dehydrogenase or glutamate dehydrogenase is not part of the urea cycle. The urea cycle starts here. Okay, back to alpha keto acids and I'm sorry, yeah, alpha keto acids that are either glucogenic or ketogenic. I think I just have, I think I have a picture for this. That's maybe next slide. Yes. All right, so like I was indicating before, the glucogenics, um, amino acids, uh, the carbon is converted into either pyruvate or oxaloacetate, and this could proceed through gluconeogenesis. That's why they're called glucogenic. It's also possible they could be broken down through the TCA cycle to CO2, and then the coenzymes go on to... Um, go on to oxidative phosphorylation. So if you look at any that are in yellow here, basically all roads lead to oxaloacetate, and then those can go to make glucose. They don't have to. It's not a guarantee that anything that's in yellow is going to for sure be used to make glucose, but it could be used to make glucose, and that's why they're called glucogenic. Whereas... Some of the other ones that are in blue here will either become acetyl-CoA or become a ketone body um, and lead to the production of ketone bodies. Again, it's not saying that for sure they're going to become ketone bodies, but they could become ketone bodies. And no, you don't need to memorize which is which. Just know what, if it is ketogenic, where does it go? If it is glucogenic, where does it go? Well, I don't need to erase this. Moving on. All right. My last little thing that I think is kind of cool um, and highlights a little bit of... 
a difference between the amino acids is there are there are three amino acids that don't get broken down in the liver. And those are alanine, isoleucine, and leucine. And these are degraded, we also call this catabolized. Um, not in the liver, I believe it's in the muscle. Because the very first enzyme is this branched chain amino transferase. And all of these are considered branched amino acids because their side chain is branched. This enzyme is just, it's not in the liver. So these amino acids cannot be catabolized in the liver. They're broken down elsewhere, like I said, in the muscle. And this amino transferase does the same thing that the that the transaminases does. So if you notice, all of these are alpha keto acids. So you make the alpha keto acids first, and then you'll put a CoA on them, and they'll turn into all these molecules that have CoAs, and then they'll can proceed through um, catabolism. And we'll look at more of these um, in some interesting problems in class, but there's this this disease called maple syrup urine disease. And basically, if this enzyme that puts the CoA on all these alpha keto acids, if that coenzyme or if that enzyme is deficient or malfunctioning, in, usually in infants, then these you won't get you won't get any of these, obviously. But these alpha keto acids will cause your urine to smell like maple syrup. Interesting, huh? That's it. That's all I'm going to say. That's it. I'm going to end it there. I will um I will see you in class.